Well, hello there. For those who don't know me, hi back. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I usually am standing up here and hiding behind a guitar, so this is a very different experience uh, for me this morning. Um, but we're just going to get right into it. Today we're talking about a topic uh, that, uh, just a small little thing, uh, life. Anybody have any experience with life? A few of you, a few of you, some others, not so much. I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, And so we're going to talk about life, and I reckon that Don asked me to preach on life today because he knew that I couldn't say no, and because my daughter's name is life. It's actually Zoe, but that's what that word means. That's what that name means. Zoe means uh, life. And on the day that Zoe was born, uh, I did the typical Facebook announcement, she's here, everybody's healthy and happy and all that stuff. Um, And I also wrote a little bit of an explanation about her name and why Laura and I named her Zoe. Uh, So this is what I wrote. The name Zoe is a transliteration of the Greek word zoe, which is translated life. In the New Testament, particularly in John's writings, zoe is often talked about as something that finds its source in Jesus and is given to those who follow Jesus. And it is our prayer that our Zoe will know and experience this real life in her king. It's the only time I'm going to talk about Greek this sermon. Sorry, Don. Uh, So that, that name, that word, it points to something incredibly grand. It points to the the real, the full, the energizing, world altering life that is available in the Lord Jesus. And this life, this real, life-giving, productive life, is the reason that Jesus came. In John 10.10, Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. So think about that for just a second, that Jesus was born, he lived, he died, and was resurrected so that you could have life. That's no small thing. It's no small thing, so it merits our attention. It merits us giving some time to think together about what this life from Jesus is, what it entails, and how we ought to take hold of it. And it's incredibly relevant to us in 21st century Australia. Our culture is constantly on a quest to determine what life is, what it means to have a fulfilled life. I think we would all agree with Jesus when he says in Luke 12 that there is more to life than the things we own and the food that we eat. Like, food is really good. I think we can all agree food is great. Owning stuff, that's cool. They're important. But once we start thinking about what a good life is, what a fulfilled life is, we very quickly realize that it has more, it's more than just sleeping and eating and drinking and owning things, right? If, if we reduced life to sleeping, drinking, eating, and owning things, if that was how we defined someone's life, we would say that it was an empty life. So what is life? What does it mean to have life abundantly? And various parts of Australian culture may answer that question differently. Is the good life found in making lots of money? Is the fulfilled life uh, getting married and having lots of kids? Is the fulfilled life not getting married and not having lots of kids? Does living life to the full mean experiencing as many virtues and vices as possible to get every single possible experience you can in the short time that we have on this earth? Is true life the the ability and the freedom to self-identify, to decide who you really are on the inside and embrace it? Is a good life having lots of friends or more and more followers and likes on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter? Humans are constantly striving to answer the question, what does it mean to truly live? And it's an essential question because we only get one shot at it. It's one that we have to have an answer to because without an answer to what it means to truly live, we are aimless always trying to fill that void with the next fleeting promise of fulfillment. And that is no way to live. So thanks be to God that we can look to him for the answer because, spoiler alert, true life is only found in him and it is given freely to all who ask. So we're going to consider together what that life looks like. And the first place that we have to go, the first thing that we have to think about and that you probably already are thinking about is 
eternal life. That phrase, that really important phrase that we see throughout the Bible, eternal life. And our minds immediately go to the end of time, to thinking about the new creation, new heavens, new earth, immortal life, life with Jesus forever. And that makes sense. We're only going to stay here for a moment because we're going to move on to other things. But for just a moment, let's think about that eternal life. In John 6, 54, Jesus says, The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus died and was raised to save us from sin and death. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus and follows him will live eternally with him and his people in the new heavens and the new earth. This is the promise and the hope of the gospel that although we may, although we will experience sickness and sadness and brokenness and death and war, these sufferings are temporary effects of sin. The sure and certain promise of eternal life in Jesus is the remedy to sin and its effects, even death, especially death. It is the promise that though the world groans now and we with it, this will be made right when Jesus returns. If you have put your hope in Jesus, a day will come when suffering is reversed and when new life is given. So let me encourage you. If you know Jesus, if Jesus is your Savior, your King, then hold on to the sure and certain hope of eternal life. No matter how great the suffering is that you experience in this life, Jesus will make all things new. And let that knowledge be the lens through which you see the world and through which you see your suffering. Not to diminish your suffering, but to give you the strength of hope to endure to the end. We see this in the Apostle Paul. In Romans 8, 17 and 18, he writes, If indeed we suffer with Christ, so we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that our present sufferings cannot even be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. Paul was no stranger to suffering. Relational breakdowns, shipwrecked, stoned, exiled, imprisoned. Those sufferings, like the the experience of your sufferings, they are real. They are hard and they are not good. But they are not the end. They are not all there is. They will be made right. You will be made new. And that is the hope of eternal life. So if you don't know Jesus, if you've not put your trust in him as your savior, if you've not followed him as your king, what are you waiting for? Jesus died so that you can live. Jesus was raised so that you too could be raised and the effects of sin, whether sickness, separation, death, hopelessness, addiction, violence, these things could be reversed forever. Eternal life is yours if you want it, regardless, regardless of whether you are good or bad or smart or special or a man or a woman or cis or trans or black or white or brown. Eternal life in Jesus is offered to all people without distinction. And if that's a new idea to you, if it's something that you have been thinking about, if it's something you want to talk about with, something, with someone, please do. It's an important conversation. So whether that's me or Don or Beck or the person sitting next to you, please talk to them. Come to a discipleship group and hear about the good news of Jesus. Now, the eternal life that Jesus gives us is not just a future reality, though. It is life in the here and now. So eternal life is not just a future thing. It is a right now thing. That's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. But just for a second, put a pin in that. Eternal life is right here, right now. And we're going to back up for a moment. We're going to back up all the way to the beginning. Because God has been in the business of giving life since the very beginning. In the creation story in Genesis 1, we read that all the animals that God made had a living breath within them. And then in Genesis 2, when God creates man, he breathes a breath of life into Adam. And then Adam becomes a living being. 
As one scholar writes, there is no life without divine power. See, life is from God. It is a good creation of God's. God isn't waiting until the end of time to give life. God didn't start giving life with Jesus. Our God has been a life-giving God from the very beginning because he is the life-giving God. It is a part of who he is. It is an intrinsic part of who our God is. He gives life. Let's linger on creation for just one more, one more moment because at creation we see God's perfect intent, the ideal that is demonstrated by his creative acts. And what is that ideal? It's life. It's creating and making life. That's what he was doing at creation, creating this unending life that is shared with each other and with him. But of course, we know what happens. The serpent spoke. Humans were deceived. And what was the result? Death, the antithesis of life, the antithesis to God's good creation. And we can skip then to the other side of time. We started with creation, now let's head to the end. What characterizes the new creation? Again, it is life. Let me read a few verses from Revelation 22. Verses 1 and 2, the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Water as clear as crystal, pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Don't miss that. The water of life, it is sourced from God. It comes from God, flowing down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. In verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they can have access to the tree of life and can enter into the city by the gates. In verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wants it take the water of life free of charge. You see, God's mission at the end is the same as his mission at the beginning, life, life for all. And so this raises the question, if our God is the life-giving God, if history as we know it begins and ends with him giving life to all, then what does that tell us about the in-between time? Everything between creation and new creation. We know that our God does not change. So just as he was and will be the life-giving God, so is he the life-giving God now, today. So eternal life isn't only about what will happen in the future. It impinges on our present reality. Eternal life is something that if you follow Jesus, you already experience eternal life, at least in part. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, I tell you the solemn truth, the one who hears my message and believes the one who has sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, but has crossed over from death to life has crossed over from death to life already. If you have placed your trust in Jesus, you already have eternal life. You are not waiting for eternal life. It has already been given to you. And in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, Jesus tells him, unless a person is born from above, they cannot see the kingdom of God. They cannot see the kingdom of God unless... They have been born. New birth, new life is the prerequisite to seeing the kingdom of God. New life, then, is not the end of the Christian journey. It is the very first moment of the Christian journey. The Christian life begins with life. But that can be hard to get our heads around. We understand what it means for God to make life, we understand the concept of eternal life, new creation, but what does it mean that we receive new life now? now? There are two aspects to that question we need to unpack. The first is, how do we experience that life that Jesus gives to us? What, what is that? And the second, what do we do with it? So first, how do we experience the life that Jesus gives to us? Well, we experience that in relationships. 
In John 15, we get one of the clearest pictures of how life flows to us through our relationship with Jesus. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in them bears much fruit, because apart from me you can accomplish nothing. In the same way that a branch is dependent on the vine to share in its life, so are we dependent on Jesus in the life that he gives to us. And in the same way that a branch continues to be enlivened by the vine so long as it remains on it, so too does Jesus continually enliven us so long as we remain in him. In the same way that a branch is enabled to produce fruit by that continually life-giving life of the vine, so too are we enabled to produce fruit by the continually life-giving life of Jesus. So to sum it up, if you are in relationship with Jesus, you are given his free-flowing, never-ending life. You are made alive and you are enabled to be productive, to produce fruit. And so if we experience this true energizing life by knowing Jesus, by remaining in Jesus, then there is a very clear practical consequence for us. We need to pursue Jesus and remain in Jesus. Because there will be times when you are tired and the thought of pursuing Jesus feels like too much. Or you're so busy that your prayer life atrophies or becomes non-existent. There will be times when you are tempted to forsake Jesus and to forsake the faith. And to all of these, I say, persevere instead. And persevere by growing in your knowledge and love of Jesus now by seeking him every day and knowing him more. If you want to experience the eternal life that is available in Jesus right now, then seek him, know him, and follow him. And there's one other place that we experience this life in Jesus. We also experience it in relationship with God's people, with each other. Uh, On this one author writes, life is often found in the vitality and health of a community where the group shares its ups and downs, where the life of the other is my own life, and vice versa. I think we've all experienced this. I hope we've all experienced this, how a community of faith can be life-giving. You may have experienced the opposite of it, how not being in a community of faith uh, feels, feels bad, feels empty, or an unhealthy community of faith can actually suck life out of you. And thankfully, uh, in my seven years here at City Light, I have seen so much of this life-giving life that happens within community with God's people, especially in our DGs. People sharing their ups and downs, caring for one another, taking on each other's burdens, and celebrating each other's victories. So City Light, don't lose that. Don't lose it, and actually dig into it more. Double down on that. Be a people who live in community with one another and in so doing who create this just enhanced experience of life so that we all can feel the love of Jesus that is flowing through and in each of us to each other. Eternal life is not just waiting for the end of time. It is life that is filled up now by others and that seeks to fill up the lives of others. Even just enjoying good times with each other is an aspect of eternal life. Because we recognize, as we talked about at the very beginning, there is more to life than food and the stuff we own. We recognize that life is enhanced when we seek the good of others and with others. One scholar writing about John's gospel helped me understand this with a a really clear example. He writes, eternal life is the healing and transfiguration of life in all the ways that mortal life falls short of life in its fullness. But it is more than the putting right of what is wrong, important though that is. Eternal life is also the fulfillment of all that is good. It is significant that the first of Jesus' signs, turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana, does more than meet a need. 
running out of wine at a wedding feast would certainly be a serious source of social humiliation for the family, but Jesus does more than solve a problem for them. The quantity and the quality of the wine that he provides are far in excess of need. What wine, enjoyed in a social context of this kind, does is to enhance life a little, especially in the enjoyment of fellowship. The miracle points to the greater enhancement of life to which Jesus refers when he says that he came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so, my takeaway from that is Jesus partied, and we should party too. (laughs) But seriously, seriously, we gain life from each other, and we give life to each other. And there's value in that. So we experience the life that Jesus gives us in relationship to him and in relationship to each other. So remain in Jesus, and as he enlivens and energizes you with his life, so you can both give and receive life in community with the people of God. And that's the first question. So how, 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 did we, how do we experience this life that comes from Jesus? We experience it in relationship with Jesus and each other. So we need to actively build and pursue those relationships. And the second question was, okay, then what what do we do with this life? If we experience this life in relationship, what do we do with it? We've already begun to answer that. We use the life that we are continually being given to give life to each other. But there is more to say here. First, we must recognize that this life, this true life, fulfilled life that we have from Jesus is a life devoted to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, Paul writes, For the love of Christ controls us, since we have concluded this, that Christ died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. The life we have from Jesus is a life devoted to Jesus. And this isn't because God is some distant despot who demands our fealty or else. It's because it is in our devotion to God, in our remaining in Jesus, that real life is truly found. In Psalm 1611, King David says, You lead me in the path of life. I experience absolute joy in your presence. You always give me sheer delight. In John 4, we read, in him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of humankind. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, our best is only realized when we stop living for ourselves and start living for God in the light of Jesus. The second So life that we get from Jesus is a life devoted to Jesus. Second, the life that we are given by Jesus enables us to follow him in the way that we live now. So consider Paul's words in Ephesians 2. Caveat granted, Paul's larger purpose here is to talk about God's amazing grace in our salvation. But he also speaks to this very issue of what we do with the life that we're given in Christ. So I'll read the first five verses, uh, which set the foundation, then jump to verse 10. Uh, The first five verses are a little bit stilted, but that's intentional. Paul wrote one really, really big sentence where the whole time you're just waiting, like, okay, Paul, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? And then verse five, we finally get to it. So, although you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the domain of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest, yet God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, and we being dead in our offenses, and here we get finally to the big point, everything is leading up to this statement right here, God made us alive together with Christ. God made us alive together with Christ. What do we do with that? Well, verse 10, we are his creative work, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we can do them. 
We have been made alive in Christ. We are God's new creation in Christ. And for what purpose did God do this? To make us who we need to be, to do the good works that he has prepared for us. The life that we get from God is a productive life. It is an energizing life so that we can follow Jesus. The life that we receive from Jesus is intended for and enables us to produce good works. That brings us to our third and our final point. This is getting us to the crux of what true life, what fulfilled life really is. The real life from God is life-giving life. It is at its very core inherently sacrificial so that others may also have life. In John 12, 25, Jesus says, the one who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. Read that one more time because it sounds really weird. The one who loves his life destroys it, The one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. That sounds like a paradox. If you love life, how do you destroy it? If you hate life, how do you get eternal life? That doesn't make any sense. But if we understand what this real life from Jesus is, that at its core it is inherently sacrificial, that it is defined not by holding onto it, it is defined by giving it away, then what Jesus says makes perfect sense because holding on to the life that he gives us, grasping onto it and clutching onto it is antithetical to what life in Jesus is. To live is to give life for others. We, of course, see this the most clearly in the pattern set before us by Jesus. He sacrificed his life so that we could live. And if that's what our king did, If that's what Jesus did, how can we do anything less? We are called to imitate him. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go die on crosses. I'm not saying we don't need to go die on crosses. What I'm saying is that we have to take the life that we're given and give it away in kind. And the good news is, this is all good news, but some more good news is that we have a never-ending supply of life. So long as we remain in Jesus, so long as we remain connected to the vine, we have life. So this isn't an issue of uh, we get life and then we give it away and we have no life anymore. This isn't a, there's one pie and it has 12 slices and that's all there is. And if you give those slices away, then other people don't get the slices. No, this is a continual outpouring of life that is, it, 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 it multiplies The more we give life, the more life there is, and the more life there is to be given. Jesus is continually pouring his life into us so that we can continually pour our lives into others. So if we have this never-ending supply, if we see the pattern set before us by Jesus, then why not just keep giving it away? Keep getting filled up by Jesus and keep giving it away so that others can be filled by Jesus, so that others can know that life in Jesus. And so, my last encouragement to you as we tie up these threads. So the life that we have from Jesus is a life devoted to Jesus. So be devoted to Jesus. Live for him first before anyone else and above all other things. And that truly is where we will experience our best life. We are made alive in Jesus so that we can do good works prepared for us. So make good use of your life by doing good. Use the life you've been given to bless others to work for the kingdom of God. Be a light to the world just as Jesus is a light to you. And the life that Jesus gives us is inherently self-sacrificing. It's the life that pours itself out so that others may have it. Just as Jesus gave his life so others may live, so are we called not to greedily grasp onto what Jesus gives us, but to be sacrificial, to give of our lives so that others may live as we do. So go and live the life Jesus has given to you by living for others the way that Jesus does, by laying down your own life for them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you because you are life-giving. 
you had every right to not come down, to not show us who you are, who God is. And yet, you came and you gave your life for us. And you showed us what real life really is. And Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you that we live now, not because of anything we've done, not because of anything uh, about ourselves, but because you have freely given it to us. And so, Jesus, we pray that we would imitate that, that you would enable us by the life that you give to us, by your spirit, to go and live for you by living for others. That we would be willing to sacrifice for others. That we would see the great, incredible value of sharing the life that you have given to us with everyone. God, we pray for your energizing life just to continually be filling us up, that we would receive that, we'd be empowered by it. And Lord, we wait for the day when you do make all things new. And until that day comes, may we continually be working towards it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.